Good afternoon. Committee Chair Alexander, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony this afternoon. I'm Ann Summers, and I'm the chairwoman of Not Dead Yet, a national grassroots disability rights group that opposes the legalization of assisted suicide as a deadly form of discrimination against the old, ill, and disabled. Our broad base of supporters includes people with a wide variety of disabilities, many who use ventilators and daily experience impairments that proponents here today have described as the reason we need the bill. Many of these people have been told by confident and well-intending doctors that they would not live to see another birthday. And years, if not decades later, we're not dead yet, just like our name. And we know that we're the real experts on the front lines of the healthcare system that serves and sadly often underserves dying people. Although people with disabilities aren't usually terminally ill, the terminally ill are almost always disabled. And that is why we're here testifying today in strong opposition to the Death with Dignity Act of 2015. In order to have an honest conversation about these topics, we must start by confronting head on the myths that surround bills like this one. I have detailed five pervasive myths in my written testimony, which include the myth that this bill is a public policy response to intractable pain, the myth that this bill provides dignity and control to people who are suffering, the myth that this bill is only for those who are terminally ill, the myth that this bill has adequate safeguards against abuse, and the myth that this bill is not an affront to people with disabilities. Because of my limited time today, I will focus only on abuse and coercion. It is a myth to say this bill has adequate safeguards against abuse. Depressed people will be harmed by this bill. Oregon statistics for the last five years show that barely 2% of patients were referred for psychological evaluation. So the notion that this bill's provisions will yield any better results in that respect are unfounded. We're not talking about doctors who know their patients well. I've had my primary care doctor for over 25 years. He knows me extremely well. But we're not talking here about doctors who know their patients well. The median length of doctor-patient relationship in Oregon is 13 weeks. The range is zero to 19 weeks. These are not long-term relationships doctors have with these patients. Understand this important distinction. Depressed, suicidal people without a terminal disability diagnosis receive suicide prevention services. But under this bill, depressed, suicidal people with a terminal disability diagnosis do not. And if one doctor declines to approve the lethal prescription, families can simply go doctor shopping, as has been referenced earlier today, circumventing the bill's purported safeguards. Instances of this practice are well documented, and in Oregon, it is common knowledge that the main organization that supports assisted suicide, which is well represented here today, Compassion and Choices, formerly known as the Hemlock Society, will gladly refer to assisted, someone to assisted suicide friendly doctors. The vast majority of doctors who prescribe this, the lethal dose in Oregon are Compassion and Choice referrals. So if the idea is that the individual doctors provide safeguards, doctor shopping renders those safeguards void and essentially leaves assisted suicide on demand. First, like in Oregon, this bill doesn't grant the Department of Public Health investigatory authority and resources, so investigations of abuse and coercion are foreclosed. An earlier witness today claimed he has reams of data to defend the Oregon experience. But here are the problems with that data. And on the last panel, we had uh, an individual who said that evidence from Oregon was cited in support of supporting this bill. But there are two problems with that. There are actually many problems with that. But first, like I referenced, the bill doesn't grant uh, investigatory authority and resources, uh, and investigations of abuse are foreclosed for that reason. Secondly, reporting about doctor-assisted suicide deaths is self-reported. So here's the analogy I think might get through to people. That's sort of like asking drivers to tell their home state um, how many times they've sped over the course of a year or how many times they've rolled a stop sign. Um, it explains the absurd and disproven claim by proponents here today that there has not been one case of abuse in Oregon. It's preposterous. In addition to the bill being ripe for abuse, it's an affront to people with disabilities, and I'll close on that thought. In two weeks, the nation will celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act and acknowledge the contributions and struggles of Americans with disabilities and offer a recommitment to its aims of ending disability discrimination. However, here we are today on the virtual eve of this important anniversary of our beloved civil rights law, 
giving testimony about what proposed legislation that would legalize disability discrimination in health care. You may say, why is it dis disability discrimination? Because some people get suicide prevention and others get suicide assistance, and the only difference between those groups is health and disability. The top five reasons for asking for the prescription in Oregon are about disability and not about pain. This bill reinforces the very societal prejudice that disability rights laws were meant to dismantle, and it alters societal focus from respecting and accommodating people with disabilities to assisting them to die. Thank it's you. It's an affront, and we, we ask you to reject it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony.